Good afternoon. Um, yeah, I see that I'm the last speaker. So, so um, as he said, my name is Natasha Rangus. I'm an assistant professor at the Ohio State University. Speaking today about uh, a continuation of work that has been undertaken at the University of Florida, funded by the Florida Department of Transportation, looking at alternative uh, corrosion protection systems for post-tensioning tendon bridges, um, or post-tension bridges, rather. This uh, project has been ongoing since 2014 uh, and has moved from one project and now uh, one project has been completed and now FDOT is funding a subsequent two uh, based on the findings of some of what I'm going to present today. The uh, PIs that are remaining on those projects are, are Gary Consolazio and Trey Hamilton at the University of Florida. And then, of course, we have graduate students both at UF and at my university helping um, with some of the, the analytical work. So uh, thankfully, one of the earlier speakers will allow me to do the motivations. Um, this is a topic pertaining to post-tensioning tendon bridge systems, uh, where we have encountered some durability concerns with regard to the corrosion protection systems, i.e. cementitious grouts. Uh, the, the, the causes of, of those durability concerns are, can be multifold, how those came to be, but anyway they exist and so different uh, different approaches in resolving issues with cementitious grout are underway. Uh, one that is motivating this entire project is the idea that perhaps we need to shift to a different type of filler material for post-tensioning tendons um, at, as, uh, as a form of corrosion protection. So post-tensioning tendon Tendons have their primary components of pre-stressing steel. We have some sort of filler material, the traditional or conventional material that we've been using here in the United States is cementitious grout. Uh, depending on whether or not those tendons are te internal or external to the primary concrete cross-section, we design those as bonded or unbonded uh, with different, different views on the, the structural behavior at flexural strength. When we shift to what I will be calling a flexible filler material as uh, instead of cementitious grout, something that's been done in European countries, in France and German, Germany most notably, and then now apparently uh, also in Korea, we have some use of unbonded tendons instead as, as a method of protection of post-tensioning tendons. When we make this material shift, we then have to consider all of the tendons as unbonded, and that has some implications in um, positive implications in terms of tendon replaceability, easier maintenance. We can remove entire tendons to look at them, um, but then also some implications in terms of design and the behavior at flexural strength. So I'll just zoom past these. Uh, Lovely pictures of what can happen with grout, what has been observed uh, as tendon corrosion occurs leading up to the most catastrophic um, examples down on the bottom where we can have a complete tendon failure in the event of an extreme corrosion um, getting inside. So Florida, the Florida Department of Transportation kind of went full force into the implementation of a brand new protection system utilizing these flexible filler materials and they had done a, a, a trip over and observed this construction technique occurring in, in France and so they decided this may be the way to go. Um, some tendons are targeted for the use of these flexible filler materials and other tendons uh, such as the deck level transverse tendons will continue to be um, filled using cementitious grouts. What I'm showing on the screen are two of the most notable uh, applications that we focused on in the first phase of the, of the research. The internal tendons inside of drop-in girders or continuous spans. So that's your, the picture on the left. Uh, the top picture is an example of a, a, an actual bridge girder with the, the four post-tensioning tendons in, in the web. And then the bottom is our later test specimen. And then uh, the other of interest are the external tendons that we typically see in segmental box girders, where those tendons are, are not connected to most of the concrete section, but pass through at sharp deviation angles through deviator blocks um, with detailed 
Diablo type shaped forms that we also considered in this research. So the, the very first project that I'm going to talk about is, is completed. Uh, this started in 2014 and it finished up in December of 2017. This is, uh, the report is available on the FDOT website, uh, and it incorporated an, quite a, a bevy of, or a laundry list of to-do items, uh, of course, starting with a literature review. There was a large portion of the project where we looked at the procedural aspects of flexible filler injection. How do we how do we do this here in the United States? Can we use the hardware that we already or the PT hardware and the uh, injection equipment that we typically that we already have? Um, and what do we need to change? Included in this particular project, there was a series of structural testing focusing on uh, flexural strength, uh, flexural strength behavior and fatigue behavior at the deviation points specifically formed with Diablo type forms, which are the, the um, preferred void form used now in Florida. There was a, finally a, a, another portion of the project that looked at the possibility of utilizing instrumentation at the anchorage to detect wire breakage at the anchor. Since we now have an unbonded system, that might be easier to detect. Okay. So filler injection was conducted at the Florida Department of Transportation lab in Tallahassee, Florida. We built a mock-up that I'm not showing you up here on the screen, but we built a 200-foot long mock-up in the backyard to have full-size injections of 200-plus uh, foot tendons with 19 strands inside, representing deviations with parabolic shapes and with the uh, harped, harped deviation more significant angle change that we would have in a segmental bridge construction. So we went through a, a number of um, iterations of, of these fillers, or excuse me, injections to, to hone the process and to figure out what would perhaps be the best practices and came up with a series of recommendations that the FDOT is, has, been, um, has been promoting and those basically, that being uh, the use of a vacuum assisted with a pump at one end and a vacuum at the other end to end without vents. This process uh, has been done now multiple times in the lab and during demonstrations uh, as a part of the then subsequently developed ASB flexible filler certification so that we then um, this information informed the development of a certification program that's been held for the past three years in Tallahassee with live demonstrations of the injection process in an effort to get the personnel up and ready uh, to inject with flexible fillers because there are a couple of differences, the most notable being that we uh, have to heat these materials in order to inject them up to temperatures of about, I'm going to flip my units here, 240 degrees Fahrenheit is the target that we're, we're pumping at. Okay. The flexural strength testing that was conducted uh, looked at, the, at two different prototype bridges to inform the development of, of a series of test specimens for experimental testing at the FDOT labs. So we looked at a drop-in girder shape that is typical uh, the, the profile associated with that and developed three internal tendon specimens for flexural strength testing, one of which served as our control and we injected it with cementitious grout, two of which uh, we injected it with a hot fil flexible filler material. We also created two external tendon specimens looking at a prototype bridge for an example of the tendon, pro uh, tendon deviation angles that we would be after and created two external tenant specimens. So these are some pictures of, of those specimens in the lab. The top left picture is an example of the external tendon specimen. So instead of building a segmental box, uh, with this ungainly thing that we would have difficulty bringing into the lab, instead we, we constructed pre-stressed segments with the end blocks at the, a pre-stressing yard in Florida, uh, brought them to to the lab and assembled them with the deviation blocks that we cast at the lab. And in, instead of having uh, 
or in order to accomplish an external tendon using this eye girder shape, we have one tendon on either side of that eye girder. You can see one in the foreground. Trust me, there's one on the other side. And so then on the bottom, this is a picture of two of our internal tendon specimens with a deck cast on plate on a deck cast on the very top. There's a parabolically draped tendon inside of each one of these. And there were three total, as I said, one cementitious, uh, one with the grout filler and two with the flexible filler. And so this is a, a another diagram trying to convey the same idea. The parabolically draped internal tendons, we tested one in, uh, one of the flexible filler specimens in three-point bending and one in four-point bending. And both of the external tendon specimens were tested in three-point. Of course, what we're after is a comparison of the observed ultimate strength behavior against the uh, estimations in the ASHTO LRFD code. So, of course, we're familiar with, with the articles pertaining to estimating the stress in the pre-stressing steel at ultimate strength for bonded conditions, for unbonded conditions. What we kind of stumbled into through, through this research was um, the relative lack of guidance of LRFD with respect to uh, members that have what I, what I will call here mixed reinforcement conditions. So members like a drop-in eye girder that would have both unbonded tendons in the form of the parabolic tendon that we've now injected with flexible filler material, but will also have pretensioned bonded strands in the bottom of the bulb. The ASHTO LRFD, as it stands now, has uh, two provisions, one stating basically use stress-strain compatibility and good luck, and uh, part B of the in that section is what they term a simplified analysis, which is something of an, a weighted average approach. So when we compare uh, each one of the pertinent estimations to, to our test specimens, we, we this is where we came upon some concern and later has led to the, the second project that is currently ongoing. So the, the first bar on the left is our, uh, I'm calling it IGS, the internal grouted specimen. So that's just compared to the bonded provisions. It, we have a, a conservative estimation of the strength. The, the, two, the two bars on, on the far right then are the external specimens, so c comparing the uh, ultimate strength to the unbonded provision of the code, we're okay there. It's when we are looking at these flexible filler specimens where we have both unbonded tendons and bonded pre pretension strand in the bottom of the bulb. If we are using the simplified weighted approach that is currently in the ASH to LRFD, we are not hitting the mark. So that, um, that leads to the, the second project that I'll, I'll talk briefly about later. Um, but just to finish up the research within this, this particular, uh, I don't think I actually have time, so let me zoom past. We did some fatigue investigations looking at these Diablo voids, uh, created another set of reduced beam specimens that we loaded rather harshly, uh, per modeling our testing against the ETAG-13 um, proof testing. So we had two different deviations in 18 degree uh, harp and an 11 degree. And what we were targeting was uh, angle changes that would under loading, under the specified loading in the ETAG 13, either cause slip across the deviation point or not cause slip across the deviation point. We did, associated with this, uh, post-cycling evaluation of the different components, so visual inspection of the duct of the post-tensioning tendon duct. That's a picture on the bottom here. You can see we get some minor gouging uh, with our, who's on the nickel? Jefferson. Uh, for reference, uh, we also looked at the the wedges. We had no concern. What we're, what we're looking at is do we have an issue with fretting fatigue or other types of fatigue now that we've removed the cementitious grout and we've replaced it with flexible filler. We have new components, not new components, but we have comp metallic components that are rubbing up against each other that previously would have had some cementitious grout in between them. 
uh, using these fatigue tests, we took out the strand that had been at that particular portion of the Diablo deviator and performed some tensile tests on those. Um, these, the bar chart is a series of controls and then the, the different scenarios, the orange being uh, the test specimen where the angle change was slight enough and the tendon was then rocking across it. Um, and so when we tested these, these strands later in an ultimate strength and uh, an attention test, we observed that these particular strands uh, experienced brittle failure as opposed to the others. Uh, we had perhaps uh, introduced the, a condition allowing for fretting fatigue. Going back full circle, though, this is a, a very extreme test setup and modeled off of uh, recommended test procedures that are not necessarily indicative of the, the force across any given deviator within a bridge prototype. So we did a, a quick back check with a, a structural analysis um, calculation to figure out that actually when we look at the tendon forces that we expect in um, in a prototype bridge were, were well below what we um, tested in the lab. Okay, so not to read all of this, but uh, we got some injection procedures out of this. We evaluated the AASHTO-L or FD provisions for flexural strength and found some areas where we, we need to, to work some things out. We evaluated the Di Diablo geometry and took fatigue resistance. Some quick pictures, because I think this is uh, maybe the more fun part. We are now t to the stage where this is being implemented in the field. The first flexible filler injections are underway. Um, this is the designed by uh, Finley. The Wakaiva Parkway down in the Orlando area is a cast-in-place segmental bridge utilizing flexible filler in the external tendons as well as the internal tendons, the bo internal bottom continuity tendons. So they, um, here's some pictures from their first injections. Um, this is, you can see a flatbed truck. They have uh, three 650 gallon internally heated tanks on top. We're, we're on top of the bridge. You might see the, the hose coming down and dropping into the deck. So these are some better pictures. Uh, the injection hose is just fed through a hole cut into the top of the deck of the bridge and um, and away they went. So they, this is a current is, is currently underway. They've done some tendons. They plan to uh, include this as a part of the ASB, uh, one of their field trips, if you will, if you happen to be going to the American Segmental Bridge Institute's con uh, convention in a couple of weeks. They're hoping to take people out so that they can observe this. Uh, they are noting, we are getting some initial feedback that the, the vacuum assist um, recommended procedure is, is something that has a little bit of a learning curve and um, may need some further modification. I think I'm, I've run, there is now a second project looking at the, this issue with the flexural capacity when we have concrete elements with both unbonded and bonded pre-stressing involved. Um, this is led by Gary Consolazio and again funded by the Florida Department of Transportation. The goal of this research is to develop design guidelines and simplified analysis procedures basically to, help, to fill in the gaps that are currently in the AASHTO LRFD for conditions like this. Um, and just pictorially where they're at, they've developed an analytical mo modeling procedure. A preliminary analytical study has been performed to inform uh, the test specimens that they are currently designing for what is the next step, the experimental testing. And with that rapid fire presentation of <laughs> flexible filler materials, I'll take any questions.